Um, I would just like to say welcome to the Science Library and uh, this year's uh, Roslan lecture. And I will give the word to uh, Head of Department of Theoretical Astrophysics, Per Lilje, who will explain to us all about uh, Svein Roslan and why we celebrate this day every year. Uh, thank you. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, dear guests, um, first of all, I want to thank the Science Library for this cooperation, for holding the Roslan lectures which we've had for the uh, several, uh, past several years. The Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics is Norway's only astronomy department. Uh, it uh, has its history goes back to 1814, when Christopher, B uh, Christopher Hunstein was uh, appointed a university lecturer of astronomy and uh, applied mathematics at the University of Oslo. In uh, 1834, he uh, uh, got built the uh, uh, first Oslo University Observatory. And then in 1928, the Oslo University Observatory got a new director and uh, we got a new professor of astronomy, Svein Rosselan, who had, was born in 1894 and he passed away in 1985. Svein Rosselan was probably the greatest astrophysicist Norway has seen so far. And uh, uh, he um, has done lots of studies of uh, well, really putting uh, modern physics into the understanding of stars was his main theme. Uh, he also uh, got uh, the old university observatory changed into what was then from 1934 called the Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics. And it's because of him we uh, celebrate this Rosalind lecture. In 1994, uh, at the 100th anniversary of, of Sven Rosalind's birth, uh, we started this series and have since uh, had one of the world's um, foremost astrophysicists uh, to give us a Rosalind lecture every spring. <clears throat> uh, in the early 1950s, Sven Rosalind uh, uh, said that we should here concentrate on solar studies uh, because it was uh, where you really got theory and observations uh, to get together in the astrophysics of, those, of his days. And uh, he opened the Oslo Solar Observatory in uh, 1954. This uh, study of the sun uh, has continued, and we have a really internationally renowned group of solar studies uh, led by Professor Mats Karlsson. And uh, in uh, November last year, we opened with uh, Mats Karlsson as the leader uh, the uh, uh, Center of Excel National Center of Excellence uh, Rocks the Rosalind Center of Solar Physics. So uh, when we open that in November, what is better to have uh, to hear about than uh, our own star today? So I will ask uh, Professor Mats Karlsson to introduce today's lecturer. Oh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce this year's Rosalind lecturer, Professor Sami Solanke. He is a director at the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research in Göttingen, Germany. He got his uh, doctorate at ETH in Zurich in 1987, where he is honorary professor now, and he's also distinguished professor at the Kyung Hee University in South Korea. He has had very many tasks in science management and science administration in European Space Agency and various space agencies and uh, advisory committees. And he's been the driving force behind the Living Reviews in Solar Physics, one of the highest impact journals in astronomy and astrophysics as a whole. But he's also had time somehow to have a very active career as a scientist. So he's uh, the principal investigator, but not only sort of formally, but also the driving person behind the Sunrise Balloon Telescope and a instrument on board the solar orbiter that will hopefully be launched in 2020. And um, he has a long series of important uh, papers and contributions in the field of solar magnetism and in the solar activity cycle, especially long-term variation of the sun. And I think we'll hear more about those things now. So please, Sami. <clears throat> 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 
So, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot express what a great honor it is to be in Oslo, but it's not just an honor, it's also a great pleasure because, believe it or not, this is the first time I've managed to come to Oslo itself. And what a welcome has been prepared by the weather, very well organized, you know, the Nor Norwegians are well organized people. Um, and the chance to give this, this lecture. So this is really a very special day for me. I will try to tell you a little bit about our life-giving star, the sun. So the solar physicists among you, and I can recognize a few, you can go to sleep now. And towards the end, there will be a few non-solar things where you can wake up again. Um, the others will go to sleep automatically when you're listening, <laughs> right? Now, the sun is a very normal star. It's just one of the 100 billion, or maybe it is 200 billion, we don't actually know exactly, uh, of stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. We live in a very quiet, suburban neighborhood, you know, a place like this. So basically, you know, this would be where the sun and we are located relative to the rest of the Milky Way. The picture is not the Milky Way itself, because we are inside it, so we cannot make an image of it directly. But it's another galaxy with a very romantic name that you see there, uh, which looks sufficiently similar that we could imagine where we are. Now, among all these 100 or 200 billion stars, the Sun is a very average star. There are stars which are bigger, which are smaller, which are younger, older, hotter, cooler, you name it. The sun is totally average. It's actually so average, and its location is so boring that in this famous book by Douglas Adam, he starts out by saying, far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small, unregarded yellow sun. That's how the rest of the galaxy would see us. And actually, you don't have to go away from the galaxy. If you ask a typical astronomer, he'll say, yep, that's true. Actually, small, unregarded, he'll underline that. Right? <laughs> and by astronomical standards, maybe that is true. But for us, as denizens of the Earth, maybe not. This is an image of the sun taken with the SUMER instrument, now defunct on the SOHO spacecraft. I show this particular because we built SUMER and it's been very, very successful over the years. I'm just trying to show the scale. Right? So the Sun has a diameter of 1.5 million kilometers. And just to put that in scale, on top of it, you see the planets at the same um, size scale. So Jupiter and Saturn you can recognize very clearly. And maybe from the back, I'm not sure if you can see, there where the blue arrow is pointing, there is a little blue dot. That would be the Earth. So you can take the Earth and you can fit it more than a million times into the Sun, and you'll still have a little bit of space left over. Right? So that's just to give you uh, the relation. So in that sense, for us, in the solar system, the Sun really is the star. More than that, it is our life-giving star. Without sunlight, we would just not simply have the energy to have higher life forms on the surface of the Earth. There may still be life. I mean, life may have even started partly in underground or um, underwater vents of, of volcanism. You have energy sources there where you could locally uh, harbor life. But on the surface, it would be extremely difficult without having the energy from the sun. Now, the sun produces a huge amount of energy. And where does this come from? And it's been doing that for the last four and a half billion years. And it will continue to do that for another five or six billion years. And it Hmm, there's supposed to be a movie here, which is not working. Sorry, it's not my laptop, so, yeah. Okay, I hope the other movies work. Otherwise, you will indeed have good reason to fall asleep. Um, 
So the movie was going to show you how in the core of the sun, where you have a temperature of 15 billion degrees, uh, sorry, 15 million degrees, and individual protons, these are the nuclei of hydrogen atoms, come together at very high speed. They're going near the speed of light at these temperatures. They hit each other sufficiently fast that they can melt together, forming a, um, a deuterium nucleus, which is a heavier form of hydrogen, and so on. This reaction keeps going till you end up with the nucleus of the helium atom, which is the second lightest. Hydrogen is the lightest element we have. Helium is the second lightest. And because the mass of one helium nucleus is lower than that of four hydrogen nuclei, the difference in mass is what is turned into energy according to Einstein's famous formula, E equals mc square, where m is the difference in mass between these two types of atoms, which is lost. E is the energy you gain, and C, and that's the key part, is the speed of light, which is a very big number, and C square is a humongous number. So by losing a little bit of mass, you gain a huge amount of energy. Now still, to make the sun shine, you have to convert billions of tons of hydrogen into helium every second. This reaction is the same that takes place in a hydrogen bomb. There you're talking of kilograms. And with a few kilograms converting hydrogen into helium, you can make the largest release of energy that mankind has ever produced. The sun does this. It's like many billions, thousands of billions of hydrogen bombs going off in the core of the sun every second. It's an unbelievable amount of energy that is produced. Now, coming back to the small, unregarded yellow sun, a lot of astronomers will tell us solar physicists, you know, you're studying the sun, it's a boring star. And indeed, if you look at this picture taken off the sun with a small telescope, it does not look Terribly exciting, even I have to admit that. There's not much to see on the surface. Well, there is this one spot, and it, you could imagine it's maybe just a piece of dirt on the lens of the projector, but it actually turns out it's something on the sun. And what we'll do now is we will dive to work. Oh, none of the movies is working. Oh, come on. This is not good. This is not going to work. Yes, I think we should do that. Sorry, but... Mm-hmm. It's okay, I can I don't need that. It's fine. Okay, very good. All right, so let's see. Keep fingers crossed, press thumbs, and let's see if this is yes. All right. So now we are zooming in towards the sun, starting with these images from the small little telescope. And while we're zooming in, we will change the telescope into a much better, bigger one, the Hinode Spacecraft Telescope. And at the same time, we also zoom in the Earth so that you can see what the relation is. This is a sunspot, the dark feature. 
in the middle. And now you see, if you look at this blow up, this resolution, see there's a lot of structure on the sun. And it is extremely variable. Now, outside the sunspot, you have these... Um, no, okay. I'll just have to talk you through it. Um, you have these cell-like features of a bright interior and a dark surrounding. These are convection cells. This is hot gas that comes up, cools down, and then moves down as, as cooler gas in the surroundings. That's why it's dark. The biggest these cells can be a few thousand kilometers in size, which is about like Europe. But luckily, Europe lives longer because these cells only survive about five minutes. So even the European Union, for all its pressures and problems, is pretty stable compared to these guys. That's how most of the energy comes. And um, then you have these sunspots, which look different somehow. Oh, yeah, this is just a warning in case there are some children or people who have stayed young. Never look directly into the sun with unprotected eyes. Never ever with a telescope, which doesn't have a proper filter. You can do it two times in your life, right? Once with each eye, and then that's it. Now, <clears throat> okay, the sun is not a boring star, and it looks even less boring if you look at it not just in white light, as you can see with, with our eyes, but in special filters or special wavelengths. If you look in the ultraviolet, as you see in the movie on the upper right, you see gas at around a million degrees in that uh, movie or with a special filter in the movie in the lower left. You see gas at around 10,000 degrees, and it looks totally different than what we had seen before. So now we see structures in the atmosphere of the sun which have quite a different shape. The only thing that is always constant is that they are changing all the time, very rapidly. Nothing is ever constant on the sun. Now, what we are seeing here is sort of the everyday kind of dynamics that you see on the sun. It's a typical active region up there. Here there's a prominence, etc. But from time to time, the sun shows us proper fireworks. So in the movie on the upper right, we see a development of a solar flare. That is when, over a time of some minutes, an hour or two, the sun releases an immense amount of energy, uh, mainly in x-rays, in the ultraviolet, a little bit also in visible light. And now in the lower left, you see something else. This is a coronal mass ejection, which is when a part of the solar atmosphere is just flung out from the sun into interplanetary space. So you have many billions of tons of hot gas of temperatures between 10,000 and a few million degrees, being thrown out with speeds of a few hundreds to a few thousands of kilometers per second, shooting through interplanetary space. And we will see later what happens when one of these gas clouds comes and hits the Earth. Now, all these phenomena, and many, many more, for which I don't have time to, to tell you anything, they're all related, they're all driven by one single quantity, and that's the magnetic field of the sun and its interactions with convection, oscillations, etc. But basically, without the magnetic field, it would be a relatively boring star, as some people still think it is. Now, the magnetic field for a... Um, astronomical object that is best known to us is the magnetic field of the Earth. That is relatively regular, as you can see in, in this image. It's a cartoon, right? It's very much simplified. The magnetic field of the Earth is more complicated than that, but it just shows the main features, and the main feature is that it is a dipolar field. So it is as if you had a bar magnet inside the Earth, and the magnetic field then is a very regular pattern like that, and that was very important for exploration for humanity. I'm sure even the Vikings were using this. So you can use compasses, you can use magnetic needles or little stones of magnetite to show you the way because the magnetic field is very regular. 
In contrast to this, the magnetic field of the sun, an equally simple cartoon is this one here, where you see it's a lot more complex, and it's actually much more complex than this. This is still very much simplified. And the other big difference is that the magnetic field of the sun changes within minutes, hours, days, weeks, and you don't recognize it anymore afterwards. And you can see this variation in this movie over here, where you have measurements of the magnetic field in yellow and blue. Um, this one has stopped working again. Oh, dear. Let's see. No, he doesn't want to do that. Um, yellow and blue are the magnetic fields at the surface of the sun. And in white, you see these connections, as we have seen, loop-like structures, as you see also in the image down there. And so this is the magnetic field lines coming out of the sun, curving around, making a loop, and then going back in on the other side. Okay, now I had mixed things up. All right, yep, so I have twice the same, but here you see the movie running again, and you also see the, th the 3D structure of the magnetic field of the sun. Now, as I said, this is very much simplified. We see a lot of structure on much smaller scales. And if we, sorry, if we go back, and I'll show you with the, uh, you don't see the arrow, okay. If you go and look at that little yellow patch, and we blow that up in, that, in, the, in the image on the upper right, this is what we would see there. So in the little yellow patch, you didn't see any structure. Now we're just looking at that small region of the sun, and we see that here on the left is the magnetic field. White, that was yellow before, means you have a strong magnetic field. Gray means a very weak magnetic field. On the right is the brightness, and you see that there where you have a strong magnetic field, you also have, it's very dark, that's where your sunspot is. So sunspots are nothing else but regions with very strong magnetic field. At the same time, we also have little magnetic structures outside of the sunspot which with this telescope, which until recently was the, the biggest one and the one with the best resolution above the Earth's atmosphere, um, that was about the best that we could do. But we know from theoretical studies that also in such a small region as there where we see that there is some structure but we can't really resolve it very well, there should be a lot of fine structure. And we said, we decided we need to have a bigger telescope that can resolve these things better and we want to have it above the Earth's atmosphere. Now the usual way to do that is to put such a telescope on a spacecraft and launch it. It's the usual but it's also a very expensive way to do it. And so we decided to go for a much cheaper way and that is to fly the telescope on a balloon. And that's how the Sunrise Project was born. Um, that's a balloon-borne telescope with one meter diameter. You see the team in front of it on the, on the left. And the main goal of the first, we have had two flights of the first flight, was to resolve these small magnetic features. And this movie shows you the preparations and the launch for the, for the first flight, which took place in, in, at S-Range, just near Kiruna in, uh, in Sweden. So you fill this balloon with about half a ton of helium. Helium, as you remember, is the second lightest element, so it's much lighter than air. And that's why helium-filled balloons rise up very fast through the air. Um, in this movie, you see the balloon up there. It looks very small. Actually, the balloon is coming all the way down to where you have the red structure. That's the parachute. And your payload is this little thing down here. Well, it's not that little. It's two and a half tons in, um, in weight and six and a half meters high. The whole thing is more than 300 meters. That's sort of the size of the Eiffel Tower. The balloon looks small here because the air is very dense. As it rises up, the density of the atmosphere drops very fast. That means in, able to, in order to be able to carry this weight, the balloon expands. 
and it reaches a diameter of more than 130 meters. That's bigger than a jumbo jet, so you can fit also an Airbus 380 in there and still have some space left over. Anyway, the balloon rises fast. Everything is held down now by the, this crane carrying the, the gondola and the telescope. This is a very tricky maneuver. They have to get it just right that it doesn't hit the crane when it leaves. Because with this telescope, we are trying to resolve like a 20 kroner coin at a distance of 200 kilometers. So it is very, very finely um, adjusted. So up it goes. It will rise to nearly 40 kilometers. It takes about two hours to, to get up there. And then after that, once it reaches, it goes through the troposphere into the stratosphere, which is the next higher layer of the Earth's atmosphere. And there, during the summer, there are winds which carry it from east to west. These are regular winds. And they will take it along. And in principle, you could go all the way around the, the Earth. But in both flights in 2009 and 2013, we brought it down in northern Canada on one of the islands there. The reason you don't send balloons further is that if they keep going, they come into Siberia. And balloons go into Siberia, they never come out. <laughs> and if you call and ask what happened to the balloons, the balloon, what balloon? <laughs> <coughs> So it's a good idea to bring them down before because the data are on board. There are too much data that are being gathered. We can't get them down. So you should better recover them. So there is a little explosive device between the balloon and the parachute. And when it's time, you press a button, the thing goes boom. The balloon is, is blown up and the whole thing comes down on the parachute and theoretically makes a soft landing. Of course, this is at 70 or 74 degrees north. There is nothing like a soft landing because there is nothing like good weather there. Right, so this is what it looked like after it landed. It was supposed to land on these crush pads, these brown things, which were supposed to take the weight, but the wind was so strong it was stormy, you know, toppled over, etc. Um, luckily, the parachute released immediately. Otherwise, if that doesn't happen, then the wind will drag everything over the ground till it hits the next rock or falls into the sea, right? And both are not good things you want to, you don't want them to happen. Um, although it looked pretty bad, but both times, uh, all the important equipment, here is the main mirror, survived intact so that we are going to fly it again a third time. And we are now designing new instruments um, to fly with that. And the data, we're very happy with, very beautiful. This is the velocity. It's not the most important piece of data, but, it, but I really like it. You know, on a hot day like this, you look, it reminds you of a swimming pool, right? And you just feel cooler when you watch it. This is, yeah. But we also uh, managed to resolve these individual magnetic features and could follow them. And you can see that one of these little bright things there. This is a movie produced by... Yeah, today the movies just somehow don't seem to be working properly. By Shaheen Jafarsadeh, who's sitting back there. The original looks much nicer, it goes longer. But anyway, we got lots of nice finds out of that. And now I think I have bored you enough with Sunrise, so let's move on to the next topic. Now, as I told you, the sun is extremely variable. Things change over a time scale of minutes, days, hours, weeks, months, years, whatever. Every time scale that we have managed to observe it, even seconds or below seconds. But there is one period which is special, and that's around 10 to 12 years. It's the so-called activity cycle of the sun or the 11-year cycle because on average it's about 11 years long. And in that period of time, the face of the sun changes completely. And you see that in this uh, image over here. So what you see here is an image of the sun taken in x-rays. These x-rays are seeing gas which is very hot, millions of degrees, three to four, five million degrees. And you have one image taken every year and so in the first image on the left, you see the sun was very bright in x-rays, and then it gets less bright, less bright, and then the little image under minimum up there at the top, the sun is about a factor of 100 less bright in x-rays. 
than it was here, but if you wait a few more years, it gets bright again. This is the activity cycle. So the magnetic field changes, the number of sunspots changes, everything changes on the surface and in the atmosphere of the sun. And one of the major open questions, besides how do you even get this hot gas in the atmosphere of the sun, why is it suddenly millions of degrees hot? That's something else that is being researched a lot, is why does the sun have such an activity cycle which is closely related with how is the magnetic field produced inside the sun? We think it's a dynamo process, that is doing that like it is also active inside the Earth, etc. But a lot of the details are not understood. And there are various reasons why they're not understood, because most of this action is happening inside the sun where we can't see directly. But another reason is that one part of the sun which plays a really key role for producing the magnetic field is its poles. And so far, we have not been able to image the poles because the Earth goes round the sun at the solar equator. So we see the equatorial regions very well, which is nice. There are really exciting things going on there. But we don't have any idea what the poles look like, really. And so and in Norway, I know you know a lot about polar exploration, right? That's been very strong in that. So in that sense, uh, solar physicists are going to move to the next step, which is solar polar ex uh, exploration. And uh, I'm happy that the Norwegian group here is playing a, an important role in that as well. The Solar Orbiter is a mission of the European Space Agency, ESA, and NASA, the American counterpart. And it's a spacecraft. You can see an artist's conception up there, uh, which will be launched from the Earth and then go into its own orbit it will leave Earth's orbit with the help of flybys of Earth and Venus, which is being shown in this, in this movie. Um, <clears throat> and it will go in very elliptical orbit. It will go close to the sun, which creates, which is wonderful for getting new science, but you also get lots of problems with that. And the other thing it does, it, it uses Venus's gravity in these flybys, as you can see here, to leave the ecliptic and go into an inclined orbit from where it can look down at the poles of the sun. You have to use such uh, planetary flybys to do that because we have no rocket engines which are strong enough to push a spacecraft out of the ecliptic. You have to use the energy you can gain by uh, going past the planet. And this is the kind of things we hope to be able to see with Solar Orbiter uh, looking down at the poles um, to see what is the magnetic field structured there, how is it evolving, and that, we hope, is going to bring us forward. Um, from my institute, we are contrib oops, uh, the, um, the magnetograph instrument that's going to measure the magnetic field, uh, and this is what it looked like um, more than a year ago before it was delivered to the, to the, uh, to the spacecraft. It's been mounted there. And now we are waiting till the launch, which will take place in one and a half years. OK, now let's come from the sun to the Earth. Remember the coronal mass ejections, where you throw out billions of tons of matter from the sun. This movie shows the sun, which is that little orange ball right in the middle, and with special instruments called coronagraphs, one can see the outer atmosphere of the sun, the so-called corona, um, till far away from the sun, till 30 solar radii. And what you also see, so in the background, you see the stars going by, these big um, bright dots with the lines. These are planets. They are so bright that they're overexposed. That's why you get these lines. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is that the sun is losing matter all the time. There is a solar wind, so there is a material flowing out from the sun all the time. Most of the time it's regular, but sometimes you have these bigger explosions of material which is being thrown out, these coronal mass ejections, like there were some right now, you know, a whole bunch of them. And most of them go harmlessly into interplanetary space, but from time to time, 
one will come and hit the Earth, mm -hmm. and it produces very beautiful phenomena, the so-called uh, aurora. You have a photograph there on the right, and on the upper right, there is a movie taken from the International Space Station. It had a few orbits where it moved very far to the north. Usually, it's at lower latitudes, and it was directed over close to the poles where one could look down at the, at the aurora, which was very special. So that's, that's a beautiful aurora, of such beautiful phenomena. It's a wonderful thing that the sun produces in the Earth's atmosphere, the upper atmosphere. But sometimes, also, there are less positive effects from the sun. Because remember, these are really high energy, fast, charged particles, hot particles coming and hitting the Earth dragging the magnetic field of the sun along with them. And this can cause all kinds of problems to technical systems. And one of them, a very famous event, was a couple of decades ago when such a coronal mass ejection led to a massive blackout in uh, eastern Canada and northeastern United States. So about 50 million people were without electricity for that time, and important parts of the electric grid were just roasted, they were destroyed, and it took them a long time to get everything uh, up and running again. Of course, the damage of one such huge event is, is very large, but there are many, many other things that one has to worry about. This can be all the way from safety of astronauts, especially when they're outside the spacecraft, the spacecraft themselves, electronics, uh, failure of spacecraft, spacecraft which are brought down and burn up in the Earth's atmosphere because of solar activity. Uh, there can be problems for the health of um, airline uh, aircraft passengers and crew, and all the way down onto the ground, right? I mean, Norway is a country that makes it money from oil, and oil pipelines corrode. That means they get destroyed from the inside slowly, and this corrosion is affected very strongly by um, electric fields um, caused by these charged particles and magnetic fields from the sun. So all kinds of things one would not think of are being affected by such coronal mass ejections. And the status is that we cannot at the moment predict when a coronal mass ejection is going to be produced from the sun, especially when is one going to be produced that comes towards the Earth. And this is a very active field of research to be able to improve such predictions. We are sort of like where whether people were 50 to 100 years ago. Right? And there's still a long way to go. But for the rest of the talk, I would like to talk not just on these short time scales of hours and days where the influence of these coronal mass ejections is, but on longer time scales about the climate. And I think it's very fitting that we are having this wonderful May. And as I learned yesterday, it's probably the, so far, by far, the warmest May in, on record in, in, in Norway, or at least in Oslo. And the question is, is the sun responsible for changes in climate? And I think it's undeniable that there has been change in climate. So let's look at some of the facts, right? The sun delivers us. 1.3 kilowatts per square meter. That's about 1.3 kilowatts. That's about what if you have an electric uh, stove, you can make your soup or cook your food on that if you could collect all the energy from the sun on one square meter. We don't get all of that on the ground, right? The Earth's atmosphere uh, absorbs some, some is reflected from the clouds, etc. So we get about one kilowatt per square meter on the ground if you're near the equator. In Norway, it's going to be less because it's coming not directly through the atmosphere, but sort of through the sides. Uh, if it's noon, there are no clouds, etc. But still, that's a huge amount of energy. If you could collect and use all of that, that's coming onto the Earth, for about 20 minutes, you would have all the energy needs for humanity for a whole year. <coughs> Sounds pretty good. Of course, you don't want to cover the whole Earth with solar collectors, let them be there for an hour, and then dismantle them. But you're not actually wasting the energy if you're not collecting it. Not at all. 
because this energy is extremely important for keeping the Earth warm. If you were to switch off the sun, that means no light coming out or reaching the Earth, it would take a few weeks and the temperature on Earth would drop to below minus 200 degrees centigrade, which is cool enough that nitrogen, which is the main constituent of the atmosphere, turns liquid. So most of our atmosphere will be gone. And that is when life starts to become challenging. Okay? Now, <clears throat> what happens with the radiation in the atmosphere and on the ground, the Earth, that's a whole separate field of study. It's very complex. Different types of clouds, aerosols, uh, various things uh, producing the composition of the um, Earth's atmosphere that all play a role. Some of the radiation is reflected, some is absorbed and then emitted as infrared radiation, etc., etc. I'll not go into that. But rather, I'll ask the question could a variable sun produce climate change? And first of all, let's start with climate change. Has the Earth warmed? And you've probably all see this, seen this graph in one form or another. This is the annual mean global temperatures of the Earth over the last about 170 years, roughly. Each colored bar is the average, is a yearly average. The black line is a running mean through that. And you can see if you compare with around 1900 till now, temperature has increased on average by about a degree. Now that doesn't sound like very much. A degree is not terribly much, right? If you were out in the, in the morning till now, the temperature has changed by more than 10 degrees. However, to make such a bar, you're averaging over day and night, morning and evening. You're averaging over summer and winter. You're averaging over the northern and the southern hemisphere of the Earth, all of it. And when you do this averaging, this actually turns out one degree is a pretty big change. It's not that small. And you have to go back, if you believe the people who reconstruct climate in the past, you have to go back many thousands of years to find a time when the Earth was warmer than it is now. Of course, if you go back more than 10, 12,000 years, then you land in the Little Ice Age, and then you had really big changes, right? That was like five to seven degrees or more, even less than it is now. So that was a really big change, right? That would be off scale, somewhere in the cellar. Um, but for the Holocene, since the end of the last ice age, climate has been relatively constant, and this is a big change. Now, if you're still not convinced, one degree, then let's see. Right? You all know about glaciers. That's the nice thing about talking in a northern country. And here are two pictures of the Rhone Glacier, which is um, a nice glacier, or, yeah. It was a very imposing glacier. It still is a glacier in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, where the Rhone River starts. And these are two pictures taken 60 years apart. You can see the arrows at what time. And on the left, in 1900, you, saw, you see that the glacier came all the way down into the valley. In 1960, you can still see a little bit of the glacier and near the top there. Um, I didn't put in a picture because I didn't find one taken from exactly the same place. You can see the same building there, etc. But in other photographs, you don't see the glacier at all. It's still there in the top part. But since 1960, it's again lost more than half of its mass. Another very imposing picture is this one, this set. The lower picture taken in 1941 of the Moore and Riggs glaciers in Alaska, which came together. And you can see there is a sea of ice. By 2004, well, it was just a sea. Also, if you look here, it's barren rocks. In the upper picture, there's a forest. So obviously, there was at these very northern latitudes or in regions where it is colder, climate change 
often has a much more dramatic impact than, let's say, near the equator or in regions which are more stable. Now, of course, the main question that people fight about is, is global warming man-made? And for that, I think it's, it's good to look at this diagram, which is the amount of carbon dioxide, which is the main man-made greenhouse gas in the Earth's atmosphere. This diagram starts here in the year 1800 and goes till around 2000. It's been going on since then, still increasing. And you see till about 1800, there was no big change. Right? So this is 260, 280, 300, so you're far from zero and the change was very small. But since then, carbon dioxide has been shooting up exponentially, basically because we're burning oil and gas and that releases, when you burn that, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And just for comparison, you see the same period of time for which we had the temperature change in the upper diagram, the previous one, is now inside this um, green part here, and you see that's exactly the time when carbon dioxide was going up very, very dramatically. Now, you've all heard of all the negative effects that global warming has. And indeed, you know, the polar bears are something that are talked about a lot. And since Svalbard is a part of, of Norway, I'm sure you know all about that. And so here, you know, there is the Solanke polar bear giving a lecture to the other interested polar bears. And he's saying the bad news is the ice cap is melting and it's going to be almost impossible to catch seals, which is what polar bears like to eat and need to survive. But... There's also good news. The good news is, if we keep moving south, there is tons of fat animals called humans who cannot run very fast. So, okay, the polar bears are safe, right? Now, let's move on to the question about could the sun have had an effect on climate change? And for that, we need to have records of solar activity going further back in time. Remember, we are talking here over hundreds of years uh, that, that climate change happened. And what you see here is the longest running direct measurement that we have of a solar quantity, which is a very simple one, and that's the number of sunspots. So you take a small telescope, a lousy little telescope, and you Look at the sun, well, better not with your eyes, you can project it, or you have a filter, or whatever. And you see how many sunspots are there on the sun, and then you use a little formula, and then you get this sunspot number. And people have been doing that since 1610. There is a good reason they didn't do that before, because in 1609, the telescope was invented, so this happened very soon after. Telescope was invented, people discovered sunspots, they were very excited because the sun was supposed to be According to Platonic theory, it was supposed to be a pure body. It's a heavenly body. And now suddenly it had spots on it. Right? They were all called maculae. It was, a, it was an error. It was not something that was not supposed to be there. So people were very excited by that because this uh, was a revolution. And so they observed them very carefully. And they found out that you see that the number of spots increases and decreases. And indeed, if you look at the time between two such peaks, it's around 11 years. So it's a solar cycle that I've been showing you with the, with the x-rays. So you see that in the sunspots very well. It's a solar cycle. It's not a solar period. It's not an oscillation exactly, because some of these cycles are longer, others are shorter. But in particular, some are really huge, and others are extremely weak. And there was this period of time, well, 1640 and 1700, when there were almost no sunspots. And at the same time, that was the so-called Bonder minimum, when there were no sunspots, was also the time when, at least in Europe, we had the coldest part of the Little Ice Age. Now, again, the Little Ice Age was a time of bitter cold and hunger, and lots of people died. It didn't help that the 30-year war was also going on, and people were killing each other. But it was not a happy time 
on the other hand, you know, humans try to make the best of it. Here's a painting by Henrik Averkamp um, of um, skaters on one of the frozen lakes in Gracht in Holland. And you have a lot of these paintings of people skating in winter on these uh, frozen surfaces in this period of time or a bit earlier. It doesn't really happen that much anymore. I spent a sabbatical in, um, in Holland many years ago, well, not that many, but still some years ago, and was looking forward to going skating. It was winter. It didn't happen because you could go skating in the skating ring, but the canals and the, and the lakes, they didn't freeze. And that seems to be relatively regular. So it's much warmer now than it was at that time. Also, there is another period with uh, weaker sunspots around 1800. That was the last time that the river Thames froze in, in England sufficiently that they could have a Christmas market on it. They built houses and stuff on the frozen river Thames. Never happened again. But again, you have to be careful because in the meantime, they've built dams and stuff and the water flow is different. Okay, so over this long period of 400 years, we have a couple of correlations, but it's not really enough. You need to have a much longer time series to be able to say if there is a connection or not. We don't have a direct time series because, as I said, the telescope wasn't there. There are a few naked eye observations of sunspots before that, but it's not very reliable. But luckily, nature provides us with a beautiful way of determining what the sun was doing on longer time scales. And this is through cosmic rays. Now, cosmic rays are usually protons, so nucleus of the hydrogen atom, shot out in energetic phenomena far away in the Milky Way, some of them even outside, coming from other galaxies, usually being accelerated in supernovae and remnants of supernovae. These are huge exploding stars which can accelerate these particles to basically the speed of light almost. And they're flying through the galaxy. Some of them also come into the solar system. Some of them reach the Earth. And if one of these charged, very fast particles comes into the atmosphere of the Earth, its speed, its energy is sufficiently high that as soon as it gets near some constituents of the Earth's atmosphere, it's usually nitrogen, it could be oxygen or argon, but usually nitrogen, the reaction is so energetic that it's a nuclear reaction. That means the nitrogen atom is changed into something else. And there are many different uh, reactions that happen, and it's very complex, as you can see in this, this right one. All these different lines you see are, are different reactions and particles, etc. I'm not going to go into details about that. But once that happens, one of the particles that is produced from nitrogen is a heavy form of carbon, carbon-14. Now, the usual form of carbon is carbon-12, so it has six protons, six neutrons. Carbon-14 has six protons, but eight neutrons. Now, the, this carbon-14 is very famous. It's used for radiocarbon dating. So if you have, you find an archaeologist finds an old piece of wood, you don't know how old it is, but you want to determine when that boat on which, from which this boat was made, for example, you know, you have a Viking boat, which you saw in the Viking Museum, beautiful things. How do they date them? How do they know exactly how old they are? And one way is you take a little bit of the wood and you find out how much carbon-14 there is in there. And how does that help you? Because carbon-14, unless... Carbon-12 is stable, so carbon, most of the carbon-12 we have on the Earth was produced long ago, before the Earth was formed, and it's still there. However, the carbon-14, after it is formed, within less than 6,000 years, half of it is decayed, goes away. It has a radioact it's a radioactive isotope. And so by determining how much carbon-14 there is, you can find out, okay, Originally, so much was produced, that is the date. But first, you have to know how much was produced. For that, you have to know how many of these cosmic rays came and hit the Earth. And that's where the sun comes in. 
because as soon as there is, a, there is a region around the sun, a big region, which encompasses all the planets, Pluto and many other objects further out, and that's the region which is dominated by the solar wind. That's called the heliosphere. That's where Helios, which is the Greek name for the sun, is dominant. Outside that, it is the galaxy which is dominant. You have the interstellar medium. Right? Now, as soon as the particles come into the heliosphere, because they are charged, they will interact with the magnetic field of the sun, which is going all the way out through the heliosphere. And if the magnetic field is strong, it acts like a shield. It keeps these particles away. So if the magnetic field of the sun is strong, very few of these particles will reach the Earth. If the magnetic field of the sun is weak, very many of these particles will reach the Earth. Few particles means Little carbon-14, many particle means a lot of carbon-14. Right? And people, you know, the archaeological community is really interested to know how much of this, this happened because their datings would be all wrong otherwise. So you have to find out how much carbon-14 was produced at a given time. And you can do that again by wood because once the carbon is formed, the carbon-14, it combines with oxygen in the atmosphere, becomes carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide, some of it is taken up by the plants. They release the oxygen, which is good for us because we need the oxygen, and they keep the carbon. Right? And they build up their trunks, their branches, etc., with that. And so your carbon-14 ends up in the tree, and you can tell exactly when, because every tree has a particular pattern. It's like a fingerprint. And from this pattern, you can tell exactly when this tree lived. Now, I can't tell because it's specialists, right? It's people who devote their life to working out exactly when this was. But you can tell within a year when this happened. So you can work out when how much carbon-14 was formed. You can work out when how many cosmic rays came to Earth. And you can work out how strong was the sun's magnetic field at that time. So how active it was. And so to make a long story short, here is a plot of, in blue, so this is starting today and going back 12,000 years. Right? This is the whole Holocene. This is the whole period of time that we have any history or civilization on Earth. Before that, we had the Ice Age. Nobody was doing any agriculture. There were no towns, villages, nothing before that. People were hunter-gatherers. So all of civilization took place in this time. And in blue, you have the carbon-14 production rate, which is a way for saying activity of the sun. So pointing down, the sun was more active, but at periods of time where it's higher up the blue curve, the sun was very inactive. Then you had like a maunder minimum. You had no sunspots. You had no flares, no weak corona, etc. And in yellow is a measure for the climate, for the temperature in the North Atlantic European region. There are some mismatches because determining the date for the temperature is, is rather difficult. But on the whole, you see that then when the sun was inactive, that is when the blue curve goes up, it was usually also very cool, right? Warmer is down, cooler is up. So something like this correlation between the Maunder minimum, no sunspots, inactive sun, and a cool climate is not unique. This has happened many times in the past. Right? This is just one curve. There are many such studies, and they all give the evidence that the sun was playing an important role in affecting climate in the past thousands of years. But for us, it's more interesting, what is it doing now? Did it play a role in producing this global warming that we have just seen and we are living through? And so let me give you a comparison between the total brightness of the sun, how much energy it's sending to the Earth, because that is what's going to influence um, temperature on Earth, or one of the things, and the temperature itself. So here, between 1850 and about 1980, 
are two curves or two sets of curves. In blue is the temperature on the Earth. In red, the brightness of the sun. And although they run sort of in parallel, and you see that there was a big increase in the temperature between about 1910 and 1940, solar brightness also increased, but a little bit it lagged behind. So it may have contributed to that, but it was not the dominant driver. If you look after 1980, it's even more severe. Temperature, as we saw, has increased drastically since then. But the solar brightness, on average, if you average over the 11 years, has actually been decreasing somewhat. So they've gone completely out of phase. So there is no excuse for saying that this latest increase in temperature that we have that we can put this down to the sun or other natural causes. In the past, there was an effect. There is also still an effect of that order. But this change we are seeing now is much more dramatic, much bigger, cannot be explained in that way. It really, we have to look at ourselves for that. Okay. So I'm near the end of my lecture, and I was, you know, it's a mixed message that I'm giving you, and I wasn't quite happy with that. I wanted to give you something mm, really strong, like, you know, the sun has been playing an effect on, on, on climate, but it's not really now, and so I thought, I don't want to let you go confused. And so I was looking through the literature, can I find something that's really strong for the end. And yes, I did. It was not in the scientific literature, unfortunately. It was in the National Enquirer. And they wrote, sun will burn out in two years and will be turned into human ice cubes. And it was two years ago, so it could happen any minute now, right? <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry. You mentioned um, the cycles of the sun uh, with the 11 years. Yes. Where are we right now? Uh, we're reaching a minimum. So this last cycle has been a relatively weak one. Um, and it's, it's going down, so we are close to a minimum. And unfortunately, we are not very good at predicting how the next cycle is going to be. <laughs> Still a long way to go. Thank you very much. It's okay, I could hear you. You can, okay. Can I press this button? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent and wonderful and interesting lectures. We have got uh, many things in our uh, thinking, but one question. Um, what is the, uh, the magnetic field? Magnetic field and solar also. You are talking about two types of mag magnetic field. Um, is there any relation between these two arts, magnetic field and solar magnetic field? Um, How it is influencing human life? Right. So there is only one type of magnetic field which can be produced in different ways. Right. So if you have a, a magnet, you take a bar magnet, then you also are, have a magnetic field around it. And in the Earth, it's produced in a different way. You have a molten metal, which is moving around near the core of the Earth, and that's also producing a magnetic field that looks like a bar magnet. And in, inside the sun, because it's very hot, it's all a gas, and the gas is actually it's a plasma. That means the atoms are broken up into their core, which has a positive charge, and there the electrons, which have a negative charge, and this charged gas moving around produces a current, which also produces a magnetic field. But it's just different sources, but it's the same type of field. 
So it's like if I have um, a battery and I put a conductor, then I will have an electric current. Right? And with this battery, I can run a machine or a light or whatever, and I can have another battery. And I can also produce a current here. Right? So it is like, and the same as for a battery for currents, dynamos are for the magnetic field. You can produce the magnetic field with the dynamo. It's, it's like a battery for magnetic fields. Right? And you have many of these dynamos. You can have one on your bicycle, right? You just turn the thing and you also produce an electromagnetic field there with that where you can do the light of your, um, of your bicycle and you have such dynamos inside the Earth, inside all the other planets, inside the Sun, inside all the stars, so there are many, many of them. And the magnetic fields from all of them can interact just like the currents from two different batteries can. May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, now we are building um, a really large ground-based telescope on Hawaii for mm -hmm. studying the sun, and hopefully in the not too distant future uh, we'll have a large European uh, ground-based telescope too. Uh, uh, what will these uh, do for us in, uh, solar, uh, in studying the sun? Right. So one thing we always fight for or against in this, uh, when studying the sun is our limitations to resolve solar structure. Right? As I said, the sun is one and a half million kilometers in size, and it's about 150 million kilometers away from us. And we also always talk about angles in, in resolving. Right? So you have 360 degrees, one degree, the degree is divided into 60 minutes. 60, each minute is divided into 60 seconds. Excuse me, I know you know all this much better than I do. <laughs> into 60 seconds, which is then a really small angle. And one of these so-called arc seconds corresponds to about 700 kilometers on the sun. Right? So that's with a reasonable size telescope, that's about what you can resolve. In the meantime, we can do much better than that. We can do 10 times better than that, or even more. And you see that the structures we saw at one arc seconds, they were not that terribly important because there's a lot of substructure there. And also at the resolution we can get now, which is about 50 kilometers, is maybe the best we can do at the moment, we still see a lot of structure which you think is not resolved. And theory simulations, as are done here in Oslo, was or as our theoreticians are doing at my institute, it shows us we have structures which are much, much smaller than that, and which we should be able to see if we have a big enough telescope. And the music plays on the small scales. That's where the physics is. Right? So you have to try and resolve these. And, and that's where these big telescopes, because they will have better resolution, they're going to play an immense role. Could you show the temperature graph again? Go back to it. Uh, the temperature graph, yeah, of, of the Earth. Yeah. Right. <coughs> what, uh, I, what interests me is the uh, flat portion of the curve from 1940 to 1980. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the last uh, f 50 years or, or so, uh, the slope looks very dramatic compared to that period. Mm -hmm. But then if you go back to 1900 and up to 1940, you had almost the same slope. So. Right. Uh, what do you make out of that? Um, I mean, the, the climate system is, of course, extremely complex and highly nonlinear. Nonlinear means a small input can have a large effect, or also a large input can have a small effect. It depends exactly what kind of input and how the, the climate system reacts to that. Um, and there are many different inputs. 
So the sun is providing, so you have the climate system is, you're talking of the atmosphere, but that is coupled to the land because it exchanges heat with the land. It's coupled with the oceans. The oceans, it just not does exchanges heat, but the water evaporates, makes clouds, rains, etc. So there is a very intimate coupling there. And it is affected also by outside. So the main external energy source to the Earth's atmosphere is the sun. It provides 99.996% of all the energy. But there are other energy sources also, which are important. And these are, for example, volcanoes. Right. So volcanoes, they usually have an effect not over a very long time, over a few years, over decades. But they can have quite a sizable effect. So if you look at this period around here, you see that the temperature actually dropped. And that was because we had a bunch of really massive volcanoes at these periods of time. So they caused the temperature to decrease. And again, there was a dramatic rise in volcanism in this period of time. That is one of the reasons, right? But there are other reasons also. It's like, uh, how has land use changed? Right? A forest and a field affect the atmosphere in a very different way. Right? And these are on, that's a small scale, so it's not big. But on the whole Earth, there has been a huge amount of deforestation going on over the last centuries or so. That has to be taken into account. So uh, many, many things. It's very complex. That makes it so difficult to say exactly what the reasons are, but some of them could be there. Thank you, I think we, I think we have to uh, stop there. So thank you again very much for this very, very exciting talk. <laughs>